Hello, and welcome to another episode. Today is February the 13th, and these past couple weeks have been very productive. I got a few things done visually that's going to affect the actual look and feel of the game, and I got a lot of things done that are going to make the experience for me going forward easy as they affect the systems going on behind the scenes. The first week of this sprint was spent just nailing out a bunch of different key components to the game that I thought were going to take a lot longer, but was easy to implement very quickly with Unity. The second week was spent on one key component to the game that's honestly going to be a life changer for me going down the road trying to write scripts, dialogues, and NPC communication through the game in the future. You'll see more about that later on, but right now let's jump into what I got done the first week of this sprint. Alright, so starting out with the all-important Trello board, you can see here's the things I got done these past couple weeks. And in comparison to the previous week, it may not look like that much, but believe me, this is huge. A lot of these components are really big and super important. If you notice the first ones, it's store data locally and save game features. I was dealing with um, basic saving of data as I thought last time, but after I released my video a couple weeks, um, one of my friends commented on the video saying, Basically, I'd suggest loading JSON data into memory at startup, though, um, which he's right about, you know, so I kind of need to. I don't know. I wasn't really thinking about how in video games you always have to save your data or you get the little icon on the bottom saying you're saving your data. I don't know why that didn't cross my mind, but I was able to implement those fairly quickly. And so now you can save the game. And then this one right here, why sorting? This is something that I've done in previous 2D games before, it basically means, well, you'll see in a bit, but it basically means um, it, it it mimics depth when you're playing a 2D game, a 2D top-down game. It's going to make sense in a little bit, but Unity has an awesome way of implementing this now that I didn't have when I was starting Unity many, many years ago, but it's great. So this was a very easy one to implement. Uh, collision? Collision? I actually made a video a week back about collision and player movement, how not to do it like I did it two weeks ago, and how to do it more properly. So this wasn't that hard to just clean up and do correctly. Camera follow, again, there's a great addition to Unity that helps you with that. And then this dialog graph is what I got done the next week. But here's what I've gotten done this week. So let's hop over to Unity now and see it all in place. So right here, you can see not much has changed. I basically changed the colors, but now we have this save button. Um, so I'm going to hit play, and again, if you've watched my video on player movement, some of this may be familiar, uh, but a good bit isn't. So first of all, what you can see is the camera moves. Kind of important, right? It's awesome, though, it's, and it's really easy. So um, if I go over to scene, actually, maybe I should be in game. Go into cameras and open virtual camera. What you can see right here is I can play around with um, the padding basically on the camera. So this blue area is where the camera can go into, but it's going to try to keep getting back to the center. And then the red area is where the camera point will never be. So if we hit play while we've got virtual camera up, you'll see that the camera follows the character. That yellow dot is willing to go into this area, but it won't go into the red. And then if I stop moving, it pulls back into the center. It's just a nice smoothing effect that allows the player to have control of where they go without like it being jarring or anything. That was easy. That was awesome. This is not something that I made up. This is something that you can just download to Unity Cinema Machine. It's great. It works right out of the box. Um, now let's, let's go ahead and play again with the character being able to move. And we're going to see... First of all, real quick, I'll show you that there's player collision. So I can walk in front of this character, and believe me, I can't move through them. I'm trying. Um, and I can walk behind them, but I bump right into them. This would look obviously better if these were characters, um, me moving in front and moving behind. But it looks pretty basic right now. And also, you'll notice what I was talking about earlier, the Y sorting. Um, you see how the red character is in front of the blue character, but then it's behind? How that works is the game is sorting the different images based on their Y value, so their up and down value. If an object is higher up in the scene, then it's going to be on a layer deeper down in the scene. 
And if it's down below, it's on a layer higher up. Um, this used to be an annoying thing to implement in Unity. You basically had to do it completely all by yourself. You had to say, um, you had to keep checking the positions of objects and say what layer they're going to be on. It used to all be manual, but now there's this feature. I think it's in project settings. Uh, is it physics? No, it's graphics. Yeah, graphics right here, where I can just change the custom axis um, and say it goes along the y-axis with a value of one. Basically, that means now it's going to be sorting objects along the y-axis instead of the usual axis that um, you have in a three-dimensional game. It, if you don't use Unity, this may not seem super exciting, but it was really exciting for me because it was a huge, annoying problem made super easy and um, barely an inconvenience. Okay, what, what else did I get done? Oh, yes. So this big one, the save feature. So as you can see, the character says everything they said, just like in the last video, I walk away. But what I've done as a test area for my save functionality, if I hit Y, I can change what they say. Let's say I've purchased something. So if I hit the Y button, they say, thank you for your purchase. Um, and so what this is doing is it's changing the input of what they said. It's storing the fact that I've purchased something from them and we're moving on. And if I move closer, it says, thank you for your purchase. But what happens if I pause the game and start up again? Because I'm not actually storing any of this because I haven't hit that handy dandy save button, it says, get your fresh fruit here again, as if I've not done anything, as if I haven't hit Y and purchased. Uh, we're not saving any data. But now that I've hit Y, if I come up and hit the save button, you'll see saving saved. And it's looking through all of the different files that have been changed, because whenever I change a file, I mark it as changed, um, or all the data that I've changed. And then when I hit the save button, it goes back, looks for all the files or the data that's changed and pushes those to the files. So now if I hit, um, if I turn it off and turn it on again, basically log out, log back into the game, I'm going to walk over here and this vendor recognizes that I've purchased from her and it's stored into the game forever. Now, obviously this will be fleshed out a lot more um, and I may have different save states that you can go into. I may make it so there's no save button that it just automatically saves in the background um, when you close out the game or periodically. Uh, but for now, this is what we've got going. This only took a couple days and it was actually pretty great. Let's see, is there anything else? Collision? Yeah, so that this was all of week one. After that, all of week two was spent on this dialogue graph, which I'll get into now. All right, so going into the sprint, I was puzzling over how I wanted to implement dialogue into this game. I knew I wanted a lot of dialogue to be implemented, but I didn't know how I was going to manage that, how I was going to be able to visually represent that um, from my perspective, if I was just going to write that all in code, like what you see right here, um, how I was going to do it. And about that time, right when I was beginning the sprint, I was scrolling through a game development Discord that I'm currently in, and this one guy posted a link to a dialogue graph tutorial, which I'll leave in the description. Um, intrigued, I looked at it and found out that this guy was showing how to create, basically how to modify Unity to allow you to create a graph, a visual representation of the dialogue system that you implement into a game. Um, I followed the tutorial, I made a bunch of changes on my own, a few changes that other people suggested, and at the end of the week, this is what I got. So, if I come up into Window, all of these are the default features within Unity, all the default editor windows. But, turns out, you can create your own windows and put them in here. So I created this dialog graph window. If I open it, again, this is all within Unity, I now have this graph tutorial system implemented. Now again, a lot of this is due to the very useful video that I'm leaving in the tutorial and then a few comments people were leaving in there as well with a few modifications on my own. So basically it's a it's a graphing system. If you've not seen one, I'm kind of show you what it is. If I uh, right click, I can create a node in the graph and then I can create this dialog node and I can connect these. So this is where the dialog tree would start. I can add options I can add a dialogue here, get your fresh fruit. And then I can have choices that this 
dialogue may lead to. So I can create another node and connect this one up. Uh, let's just go ahead and create another one. Uh, and then let's remove this choice, this third choice. And so I can just keep building this out. I can create more nodes, which I haven't yet. This is just basically um, a trial run of it. I can move things around, and this would basically be how the conversation flows, and these different options could be triggered by how the user responds, for example. So the conversation can lead off in a very meaningful way, and the best part of this is I, as the developer, can visualize it. Now, I can also go ahead and save this with Control S, and you can see over here we've got this new narrative um, loaded in over here, and I could rename it... Um, tests or something. You can see I have a few other ones and what I can do actually is I can come into this create option. Again, this window is all within Unity, but I can add stuff here as well with this dialog graph and I can create a new dialog graph, new test two, and then I can open it up by double clicking on it and I can do just like what I was doing before. I can create a new dialog system. This is going to make it so much easier because I thought I was going to have to do all of the dialog system within code, like filling out these different conversations. Um, I can actually show you how I'm doing it right now. I'm basically storing all of the information in these JSON files, and you'll recognize these comments right here. It's uh, not great. It's not very visually clear how the conversation flows, but with this method, it can be very obvious. I love this feature. Uh, again, it took me the entire second week of the sprint to implement. I crashed the game a few times, well, specifically crashed Unity a few times, but I finally got it working, and this is just going to make my life a whole lot easier. Well, that about does it for this sprint. Upcoming, I'm going to start working on that dialogue graph a bit more, fleshing it out. Hopefully we can have some better NPC and player communication going on. And then I'm going to start work on the item management system. Maybe I can even start purchasing things from the vendor by the time I see you the next time. If you like this video, give it a like. Thank you so much for watching to the very end of this, and I'll see you in the next one.